Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy, and you're listening to my podcast, Vox and Hops, brought to you by Sound Talent Media, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are one of Montreal's premier metal promoters. They put on a whole bunch of amazing concerts all year long, featuring huge, amazing international metal acts. I love them. I'm a huge fan. They also put on one of North America's biggest, best, and most exciting metal festivals. I'm so stoked to have them behind this podcast. On today's episode, I'm with Dan Lilker. He's founded a few small bands such as Anthrax, Nuclear Assault. He's a part of Stormtroopers of Death. He was in Brutal Truth. He is now in Blurring. Uh, this guy is a fucking legend. So here it is. This is Vox and Hops episode number 179. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm with Dan Wilker of uh, Nuclear Assault, Stormtroopers of Death, Brutal Truth, Blurring. He helped found Anthrax. Um, how are you doing, Dan? It's uh, super great to be with you. I'm honored to uh, sit down and share a brew with you. Oh, I'm doing fine, man. And uh, thanks. Uh, we'll say cheers. I got a local beer here from Rochester, New York. The Three Heads Company. This is their two kind. It's called Two Kinds because it is a double IPA. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Uh, let's, let's dive right into it early on. Uh, I am drinking Nogmaville. It's a hazy IPA from uh, Brassard de Montréal, right out of here in Montreal. And uh, nice. this is actually a big company beer, which I normally don't do on the podcast, but uh, I tried it and I really enjoyed it. So as with music, uh, there are no guilty pleasures. And this is actually a very good brew from a big brew company. So so cheers to uh, Brassard de Montréal for nailing this one right out of the park. Uh, let's start super simple, uh, a hard question yet simple. How have you been coping with 2020? Well, you know, uh, the whole thing was uh, first the quarantine and then just still the continual dealing with the uh, epidemic and all that. I mean, uh, personally, I am healthy. I even had a test. Oh, and that's good. I, I work at a record store so when everything hit the fan in mid-March, we kind of had to close for a little bit and then slowly start ramping up where I came back on in the early May when we were just doing curbside pickup, much like a lot of restaurants. And then, uh, <clears throat> oh, you might hear a couple of those. Um, <laughs> sorry, but uh, we are drinking, right? So as the phases, phase two, phase three, whatever they had in New York, uh, became a little more lenient. We were able to open up the store properly. So I've actually been doing 40 hours a week for three months now yes. since the beginning of June. Besides that, you know, uh, I've only gotten to visit my mom down in New York where I'm from just once. She's in an assisted living place because she's in her 90s. So obviously that's a little hairy and sketchy, but uh, you make the best of it and you deal. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Hopefully everything's going to be fine. Obviously shows have had to be canceled, but I think uh, you're familiar with that concept. And uh, you deal with it and you power through it and you hope for the best. I, I totally agree. And we have to stay positive. I keep saying it on the podcast and I keep reminding everyone. It's very, very important for us, uh, especially us as artists, to, to remain positive so that we can remain creative and uh, spread that message across uh, all of our platforms to our fans so that they can feel it and, and try to live positive as well. Yeah, because uh, you can't just curl up into a ball, you know. I mean, uh, I don't know if everyone's seen any of those SOD quarantine, quarantine videos I've done, you know, having a little fun with the dudes. And uh, that was a lot of people got – there was a lot of positive feedback about that. You know, a lot of people in their 50s that uh, were making comments on the YouTube pages those guys have just saying, wow, I feel like I'm 18 again. So uh, anything that helps get people's mind off the pit misery, you know. And <laughs> music keeps us young. Music, yeah. music keeps us young, Dan. Uh, cheers. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for, for hooking up with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, this is nice. Creamy, slightly dank. Uh, they really nailed it. Uh, it's a little bit light on the ABV. It's a 4.8. I would have liked it up at a 6.5 personally, but very, very good. Uh, 
Not my view on hazy IPA from Brasso de Montreal. Let's dance into your life. Uh, let's let's go with uh, the soundtrack of your youth when you were growing up in your parents' house. What music was playing when you were not in control of the radio? What music did your parents listen to, basically? Well, uh, actually, I was kind of lucky in that aspect. Um, when we would sit down to eat, when we had the kitchen radio on, we they tuned it to a classical music station. I still remember WQXR. Probably still exists now. And that was really important because... As the years went by, my sister got me into classic rock and stuff after that. But that classical music just seeped into my consciousness, you know, the arrangements and everything. And, of course, some people might say, well, uh, Danny, the stuff you've done doesn't sound very, you know, sedate or anything like that, like classical music. But classical music can be really fucking thunderous, you know, and powerful. And I think just a lot of that just seeped into my subconscious, especially helped when I was playing in black metal bands because of the arrangements, you know? But, uh, yeah, so I never had to uh, listen to, like, country music or opera or any, any other kind of music that I don't like. I don't mind old, you know, country music, like old storytellers like Johnny Cash. It's not just modern crap. But, uh, yeah, so classical music, I would say, which was, uh, I think, really cool that it worked out like that. And I've been saying it for, for years now that, that classical music is, or extreme metal, what, what we are involved in, is probably the closest form to classical music in the modern era. Yeah, because uh, all the, you know, the peaks and valleys and just the arrangements. Um, yeah, I would say that's quite accurate. To take me through the evolution of the, the metal scene. You've been there since the, <laughs> the beginning of it. <laughs> you you were there. So so to take me to what you think has changed for the better and also for the worst from when you started out playing versus now. Well, that is a long period. I won't go through the whole thing with all the genres. <laughs> but yeah, you know, when I first started playing, um, yeah, we pretty much, as far as thrash metal and stuff like that, I mean, there wasn't any blueprints. We just took the influences we had and rolled with it. You know, as a founding member of Anthrax, you know, we uh, first we were just influenced by regular heavy metal, and then, you know, we heard Metallica, and that changed a lot of stuff. And then, obviously, I moved on with Nuclear Assault, and, you know, eventually Brutal Truth playing Grinds and all that. But as far as the, uh, the positives and negatives that comparing today to back then, I'd say the positive things could almost be simultaneously negative, which is the ease that people can record and promote their music. Mm. That can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing because there aren't any gatekeepers. Back in the day, the people at the record labels, not maybe because they were the biggest fans of the music, but because they wanted to have an original product, would not sign every band that came out with their demos. And we already have an Exodus. We already have a Metallica. You know, so... These days, you know, people can record, produce, promote, and put their music out very easily, which can be great because they don't have to spend $10,000 on a record. But there's also a downside. Like I said, there's no quality control. There isn't somebody going, well, you know, there's no need for this band. That's already been done by that band. A lot of bands just sound like an amalgamation of everything they've listened to. You know, maybe eventually they grow and put their own stamp on things. But uh, so I'd say like the Internet, that's had a lot to do with it. Now, of course, the downside to some stuff on the Internet is like snarky people on message boards that don't have to answer for what they you know, <laughs> would not say the same thing if they were uh, face to face with you. That's but, uh, you know, I got over that a long time ago. You know, I don't really give a shit what people have to say. And, uh, I don't know. Besides that, um, I don't know. I think that's pretty much it because, like, I think my answer has the positive and negative aspects to it. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think you touched on some great things there. I think that the reason that there's no more gatekeeper and there's there's so many more bands out there just all the time, new bands, I think that's probably one of the reasons why there there's this conversation that there'll never be another big four will never have those huge iconic bands. Like when Slayer retired, we would say, we're never going to have another band at that level. And it's probably because there's no gatekeepers and there's so many, so many bands out there. <laughs> yeah, because people had their own identity back then. 
there was more of that. There was, of course, there were bands that, you know, sounds in a bit. They had aspects of other bands. You know, there were some bands that, you know, you could tell the guy had his Tom Araya scream down or something like that, like a certain Rob Urbanati from Ontario. Um, but uh, that was also, that wasn't, you know, as long as they didn't exactly sound like another band, then that was just a cool little touch. But yeah, um, that whole gatekeeper quality control thing is out the window now. And that could be, it could kind of clog up the scene, you know, and you're like, well, I've heard this a million times, you know, because uh, things get big. And you remember like 1989 when Napalm Death was big. And then a lot of people, when Brutal Truth came out, people would compare Napalm, Brutal Truth to Napalm Death because we were really fast, but it was ridiculous. <laughs> Our song arrangements were completely different and just lazy journalists would go, oh, it sounds like Napalm Death because there were blast beats. It's like, you're not even trying to, you know, look into this and discern the differences. So, whatever. They probably didn't understand. And then it is good that you mentioned that uh, we don't listen to the trolls. Rule number one, we don't read the comments. Rule number two, never respond. Yeah. You know, because... Uh, Whatever. Some people got all day to sit home and talk shit, and uh, you know, whatever. You I got bigger I, fish to fry. You got, you got, you got so many projects going on. So much, you, you know, inspiration. Where do you gather this inspiration, especially after all these years? How do you stay hungry? What keeps you going? You know, I've asked myself that many times, and I just think it's a just a natural predilection for wanting to do this music and play intense music. It's sometimes it's hard for me to answer that question because it's hard to step outside yourself and analyze that unless you're on two hits of acid or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, barring that, which I've barred for a long time, um, I think it's just this hunger I have in me. Just uh, I just like playing intense music, always have, and uh, I couldn't tell you why. It's just uh, it's like I said, it's too close to home. It's, it's hard. I wish I could say, well, it's because of this, Matt, but uh, I don't fucking know. You know, um, it's just uh, Satan and marijuana. I don't know. <laughs> Is there a time that you, you ever do feel tired and that you need to step back and take a break? Have you done that? Well, sure, but that's been a physical thing. That's like mm -hmm. after you're touring for a couple of months, you're like, I can't wait to just go home and sleep in my own bed and get up whatever the hell I want. You know, not that the life of a musician is as hard as like a regular day job, but, you know, still there's all the variables, you know, I mean, where the hell are we now? You know, Munich, Germany or something like that. Of course, I've had lots of great shows there. I'm not putting down that city or anywhere, but uh, sometimes you just yearn for stability that you have at home. You know, I can just go out and get the same thing that you always want to instead of wondering what the catering is going to be. So, but no, there isn't a philosophical tiredness. It's just um, a physical one when you get to a certain age and, you know, touring just starts to wear on you. You know, you don't sleep as good as you used to. And, uh, you know, sometimes you need a break. And how about on the musical side? How do you, how do you just keep coming up with stuff that's, that's original, that you feel is original? And are you, it must be difficult. I'm always hard on myself. Uh, criticizing I never want to redo something that I've done so how do you stay fresh if I'm writing music I uh, I have a system where if I write something I don't immediately document it or immediately record it or put it as any kind of software I make sure it's good if I can remember it oh cool that, that riff is still knocking around a couple of days later that it must be good hmm. so there's that kind of quality control you know if a riff goes in one ear and out the other it must have not been too good it wasn't worth remembering Wow. Some riffs, the first riff on the first Brutal Truth album, The Birth of Ignorance, the first actual song, that slow, heavy, grinding riff, I wrote on a fucking Long Island Railroad train. I said, I better remember this, but <laughs> um, I can do this thing where it's almost like I'm tripping. I can see a neon uh, guitar neck and all the notes bouncing around where they're supposed to be. And, uh, that's how I figure out other people's stuff too. If I have to go to a lockup tour, I just, you know, I figure out the riffs and then I can see them. I don't know. Um, yeah, just uh, whatever works, man. I don't have any kind of methods for anything I do. I think that's one reason I've gotten to where I have is because there's no formula. I just do what the hell I want. And I don't care what people think. You know, some people might have thought 
career move, going from nuclear assault to brutal truth, and now you're going to play blast beats all the time, and you know, you're not going to sell any records. That's not why I play music. I do it because I fucking enjoy it, and we did sell some records. So there. <laughs> yes, cheers to that. And uh, so you were basically the original guitar pro, <laughs> the way that you, you visualize music. With all these kids nowadays, like are just putting it on the screen and just I learning just to play it afterwards. Oh yeah, yeah. I just see that stuff in my brain. You know, that's, yeah. that's the only screen I use. Yeah. And so all the stuff with Guitar Hero and stuff, that's kind of funny. You know, if you're not actually really playing it, are you? You just looks like I don't know. It's hard to relate to. Maybe I'm old. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, let's uh, bounce into craft beer bounce into beer. Uh, before we set this up, you, you mentioned, I uh, had to ask you about the doctor. So, so tell me what the doctor told you to do. Okay, well, uh, I was first told to drink craft beer by a doctor, but it wasn't any, uh, it wasn't a medical doctor who has a license. It was Dr. Carlson from General Surgery from Sweden. Yes. <laughs> That's his, you know, uh, that's his stage name, you know, because they're uh, surgeons, right? You know, his real name is UK, UK Carlson. He's a good friend of ours. We've known for a long time, me and my wife. And he would come over and visit us and uh, go down to Maryland Death Fest with us and everything like that. So, uh, excuse me. I'm not even sure what year it is now, but it was a while back, over 10 years ago now, that uh, he turned me on to craft beer and IPAs, because before that I was just drinking whatever swill, and I was fine with that. I drank crappy beer, I admitted it. And uh, once you taste a nice, hoppy IPA, you know, a lot of people will tell you, after that you just can't go back to, you know, booze or whatever you would drink up there. That's, you know, your normal beer. And, uh, since then, yes, I've been pretty much uh, a beer snob. Uh, I don't really go for stouts and sours or, you know, vice beer or anything else like that. Any other uh, fancy ones? I just uh, I'll drink IPAs all day. Awesome. What, what would be some? Uh, being in New York, what would be some of your your very important craft beer breweries from New York you'd like to give a shout out to? Well, being a uh, now I have been a native of Rochester, New York, for the last 18 years. So I would have to say, one, I will again promote this, Three Heads Brewery here in Rochester. I hope that's visible enough. Totally visible. Good. Um, oh, God, there's like a thousand breweries. These guys have their own brew pub up here. Um, shit. It's uh, Swift, Swift Water, um, K2, uh, Rocks, what? <laughs> Trip Hammer, Brindle House. Oh, there's a lot of uh, breweries here in Rochester and the general Monroe County area. Um, I should actually mention that um, my wife and I have done stuff for McKellar from Denmark, where we have poured for them at their brew fest here in the States. They so cool. made. Yeah, they actually made a beer called Nuclear Hop Assault that is uh, a sweet double IPA, that, uh, which was, of course, very uh, flattering, very much an honor that McKellar would do. And, of course, it's fucking delicious. Um, also, there's a brewery in Virginia called the Droid Theory that made a beer, basically a Danny beer. And uh, that was called Personal Coma. Nice. Uh, they, they used the Brutal Truth logo, and that is like another nice raging strong double IPA that actually helped brew. Now, I do, not, I do not, I was basically following instructions. Of I course. didn't have any input. I wasn't like, oh, I want this hops and that. They just said, now stir that. Now pour this in there. And then, okay, cool. And uh, yeah, but uh, of course, you know, in New York State in general, there's, you know, a lot of good breweries. And uh, it's hard to support them all once it gets too hammered. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of good breweries here. Of course, I'll remember the rest of them after we're done. But anybody could Google that. You know, you put Monroe County, New York breweries, and you, there'll be a shitloads. We have our local supermarket here, Wegmans, which has an incredible selection of beer where 
if you're going there just to buy like eggs and toothpaste, don't go by the beer aisle. You know, you'll be uh, hypnotized for an hour. And it's like come home with stuff that you didn't plan to buy. And you can find this beverage. Awesome. awesome. I definitely, definitely want to hear the story behind how you hooked up making a brew with the with McKellar, who are the, the Danish craft beer gods, one of them. How did, how did that all come together? Well, uh, I had a friend in Copenhagen, this guy Anders Nielsen, who always used to let Brutal Truth rehearse whenever we would go there. He was in a band and he had a touring. He ran a booking agency. And so he was an old friend of ours, Anders. So when I started getting into craft beer, and I would talk to him and go, hey, man, you know, we're going to be over in a couple of weeks. You know, we definitely want to go by the McKellar Brew Pub, you know. And, and he said at one point, if you like McKellar so much, why don't you ask them to brew a beer for nuclear assault? Because this is when nuclear assault was doing stuff. And I was like, shit, how will we do that? And they'll go here. I'm going to introduce you to somebody. And he introduced me to a dude named Mixon Lindbergh, who no, who's no longer with the company. But he uh, was in the... I forgot what his actual function was, but he was definitely in charge of talking, you know, a lot of promo stuff for them. And uh, what manager? Operations manager. I've got uh, my other half that's more of a brain than I do. The no. point being, uh, a lot of people that work for these breweries are metalheads, and there's this whole kind of mutual admiration thing going on. They'd be like, really? You wanted to appear? With McKellar, I love your band. You know, I grew up on your stuff. And we were like, shit, we'd love to. Yeah, your beer's fucking delicious. So uh, that is how that came about. And it's almost like signing to a label. You just go over, okay, this is what we want the beer label to look like. And why do we call it this? And how does that look? And okay. And then we said, obviously, we trusted them to come up. You know, we said, you know, what kind of beer do you want it to be? How about a nice, strong IPA? Oh, awesome. Okay, we're very good at that. And, you know, uh, and then they just put it together, and they made a few batches of it. I don't know if it's still possible to get. I don't know if – I don't think it's still – at least here in the States, uh, you cannot get it anymore because now uh, McKellar U.S. has their own whole thing. They don't do it. But – if you go on untapped or something like that, and you put nuclear homicide, you'll still see some dude in Vilnius, Lithuania, right now, just going, "This fucking beer is great," <laughs> you know. And uh, so, yeah, that was uh, really cool. And then a few years back, when nuclear assault played the Copenhagen Festival in Copenhagen, McKellar, all the bands that played backstage all had a, like a six pack of those beers. That were there, so all the guys in that Hammerfall and Marduk, and they were like, "Oh, Danny, would you sign this?" And you know, my friend Morgan from Marduk's like, "I can't wait to take these back and go fishing, you know, on the lake by my house and just <laughs> throw down a few of these," which was surprising because he's either drinking Jägermeister or nothing. So I, that was pretty flattering too. But yeah, that's the McKellar story, and so that's really cool. That's really fucking awesome. Uh, having be, you're such a, a pioneer of extreme music. Uh, do you feel or do you even care about, uh, do you feel like you've had enough recognition from other musicians, from the, the, the record industry? Do you feel like you have enough recognition? I think so. I'm not somebody who seeks out recognition. You know, I don't uh, need to have my ego stroked or anything like that. Uh, you know, um, I think people... I've heard a lot of people say, you know, they have a lot of respect for me because I've done what I wanted all these years. I've played in this band and played in that band and, you know, never cared about, you know, just making a million dollars or anything like that. And uh, I'm pretty satisfied with that. You know, I think I've achieved, you know, uh, what I've wanted to achieve. And keeping in mind, I didn't set out to be a millionaire or anything like that. So uh, I can't read that. And I know. Oh, that is an interesting thing to talk about, too. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I get enough respect. Like I said, I'm not somebody who's out trying to earn it. I just do what the fuck I want. And if people like it, great. If not, I don't give a shit. But um, one thing I should bring up before we get off the subject of McKellar is... Uh, a 
few years back at the Copenhagen Beer Celebration, or whatever they call it these days, that McKellar puts together, um, I did a little project band doing covers, actually playing the SOD, Speak English or Die, which I realize is a record, you can't say that title anymore now in 2020, because it's going to offend teenagers, but uh, um, did a something played that whole album with the bands that we called Stormtroopers of Beer with yeah. me, two of the guys from General Surgery, one of which is Dr. Carlson. The vocalist was our friend Kenneth, who was a McKellar employee. Oh, cool. And we played outside of War Pigs at one of the Copenhagen beer celebrations. And did Stormtroopers of Beer it just played outside. And uh, it was killer. We just played the whole album. And uh, Tompa from At The Gates did a guest vocal on Kill Yourself, if I remember correctly. You can still probably find it on YouTube somewhere. And uh, yeah, it was just a killer show and just another cool thing about being associated with McKellar. That, uh, and after that, we played a Brewers after party inside, which was not as exciting as far as having a bunch of metalheads going nuts. It was more like people sitting at tables and but it was still fun. So it, is, it was it is very important to get that interaction with the crowd. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's night and day when, when that happens. For that matter, yeah. A lot of the people that were there knew damn well they weren't going to get to see SOD as the original members. So this was close enough. One of the dudes from SOD, and of course, I brought my bass sound. And, uh, yeah, people really enjoyed it, and they were getting hammered too. It was fun. And that, that that leads me to the, how do you feel about these streaming concerts? Is that something that you would even be remotely interested in? I I personally would find it very difficult to perform a true show the way that Cryptopsy would need to be presented in a streaming environment where there's no crowd and you're just staring at a camera. Yeah, that would be a little weird. I mean, you see some of the TV shows, you see some of the, like, you know, the political comedy shows we watch where there's no studio audience and they have to, like, pipe one in or something. And you can tell it's kind of awkward. And the thing is, with the kind of music we play, it's very intense. And you might be able to get away with doing, like, a smooth jazz concert or something like that where there's not as much crowd interaction. But I think... It would be weird and awkward, you know, just expending all that energy and not feeling it return, you know, because that's what it's about in a live environment, playing high energy music, you know, that whole back and forth. So just doing it in one direction like that. I mean, I suppose it could be done because if, if that's what you had to do, and, you know, but I'd rather wait for shit to eventually normalize and do it right. You know, we had to cancel the nuclear assault show that was going to happen here in Rochester, April 18th. And people still call up the record store I work at. What are you guys going to do the show? I'm like, how the fuck do I know? But I say, hold on to your ticket. It will be honored. You know, sometimes I just want to get sarcastic and go, well, I'm still working on that vaccine. I'll get back to you. Exactly. But, um, yeah, but uh, yeah, man, uh, to get back to your original question, it, it seems like it would be just... It would seem like it would be missing something, you know, be like having a hamburger with no meat. That is hilarious that, that your, your your fans are hitting you up at your work, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People are always coming in. I'm always signing shit and all that. Amazing. <laughs> That's cool. The boss signs it, you know, draws people to the store, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you've done it all. You've toured with everyone. If you could go back in time and relive one tour as your last tour ever and you get to do it again, what tour would that be? I know this is a, a big question. One of the quick and easy ones, which was when SOD played Japan, because that was just like a week, and some tours are too long. When SOD played Japan, I think it was 1999, that was insane. It was just like three shows, but you can imagine how long those people have been waiting and how manic the Japanese are, because, you know, it's that whole distance thing. The further you come, the more people appreciate it, like Australia or something. So, uh, 
that tour was just incredible. Of course, you have to call it a mini tour because it's just three or four shows. But yeah, that was intense and just so much energy. And uh, I'd like to, that would be amazing to relive that. I, I've been lucky during during COVID that I've been doing these interviews, and when I do an interview, it almost like my mental prep and everything before is almost as if I'm about to step onto stage. So I have that 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 mental itch scratched. What have you been doing to to fill that void of not being able to perform? Still rehearsing with my bands blurring. Of course, we don't have any shows to rehearse for. They were all canceled. So we're just slowly writing music. Once in a while, I do music at home. Um, otherwise, I don't know. I just kind of like ride along with stuff. Um, I don't, you have to understand, I stopped, I kind of retired from touring like three or four years ago, off and on. So it's kind of like I back down from stuff anyway. So it doesn't bother, bother me as much because I was already in a vibe where I was just slowly backing down from all of that. Of course, not as sudden as this, but um, I feel worse for bands I'm friends with like Immolation or Mayhem where that's their bread and butter. You know, I, got, I work 40 hours a week. You know, when these bands get their tours canceled, it's like, fuck, what are we going to do now? So uh, I... Rehearse and I stay creative and I'm surrounded by music at a music store, even some I just don't want to hear. But, um, <laughs> point being, uh, I don't feel like I don't feel particularly deprived at this moment. Like, fuck, what am I going to do now? This is all I know. I can, you know, I, I just carry on. Great, that's really great. Uh, one last question, Dan. Um, it probably never happens because you're, you're, you're very in control. But when it does happen, what is your hangover cure? Uh, three hits of weed and a nap. <laughs> that normally works, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, what else would it be? Hangover cure. Uh, yeah, while you put on some Portishead or something. Funny, nice. I, listened to, I listened to Portishead today, and that's funny. <laughs> well, so did I, because we put it on, and we have, we have a event space with a bar in our record store. Of course, it's not as busy now as it was, but uh, we still go in there and we have like chill music on in there. So I went and had my lunch and fucking Michael Jackson's Thriller was on the old pod thing. And I'm like, F this. I, uh, somebody had just recently listened to Portishead and I was like, tap, that'll work. And, uh, yeah, nice and chill. Plus uh, that Nobody Loves Me song, I imagine uh, Trump singing that to himself in the mirror. <laughs> Tough, yeah. <laughs> Probably shit. It's okay. Sorry, I don't want to talk politics. We're all good. Dan, thank you so so much for taking the time, sharing a brew with me, talking about your life, your music, and of course some craft beer. It is much, much appreciated, and uh, you're a living legend. I'm super stoked I had the chance to chat with you. No worries, man. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh yeah, man, keep in touch and uh let me know when this shit's up. Absolutely. Cheers. All right, cheers, man. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Dan is a living legend. I am blown away and stoked that I got the chance to sit down to have a chat with him. He, uh, you know, paved the way for so many genres, so many bands. It is, it is just super cool to see someone that has done all that be so humble. I love it. And it was super, super cool to get the chance to sit down and share a brew with him. Massive cheers and shout out to Dan. Everyone give him a big fucking cheers. He's a legend, as I said. I hope that you guys have a great rest of the week i have one more episode coming at you don't forget that vox and hops is now a part of sound talent media sound talent media is a podcast network and i am super stoked to be a part of it there are a whole bunch of other amazing podcasts on this network and you should absolutely go check them out you just have to go to the Sound Talent Media website. The link for that is available in the description of this podcast, and I'm going to tell you it right now. It's www.soundtalentmedia.com. Go check it out. I'll be back on Friday with another episode, but until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hopsets. Oh,